Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, to all our panelists and to all the attendees on the ITA Awards 2021. Um, this is the second uh, live sessions during this awards uh, week where we will have uh, going through the presentation of the five finalists in the category technical innovations. Uh, they will make a short presentation and then we will have a discussion on the different topics uh, during the next one and a half, two hours. Uh, so we will have during this uh, afternoon a presentation from Professor Zwang on a cloud-based intelligence system for fully automated real-time design of tunnel supporting system. Uh, hopefully, Maybe we will postpone it because it's not there yet from uh, just wait a minute. Uh, uh, from Dr. Maxwell on Missionos for the shaft and tunnel excavation monitoring system for the DTSSS2 project in Singapore. With Jonathan Marcos and Alexander Iller on virtual master rings replacing a tradition. Then with Julien Adler and Axel Barbeau on O-Dive Pro Services, decompression procedures monitoring. And uh, with Nicola Valiente, the Riaquelto Lotte 3 innovative method for the construction of sea outfall projects, the RISES concept. So uh, we will have a short presentation. And as I said, afterwards a uh, discussion. Uh, for attendees, uh, of course, you will be able to ask questions through the chat if you if you have questions. So let's start with uh, Professor Zwong. Please, you can share your screen, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, Olivia, for the nice introduction. Let me share the screen with you, and just a minute. Um, and can you see my slides? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah. First, I would like to thank our panel for the time. And um, I would like to um, highlight um, our project about our technical innovations again. You perhaps have seen our videos, so I'm not going to repeat the entire things, but give you a shot highlight on our technical innovations. Um, the first part is digital twin model. The second part is uh, I want to show you how we build the geological model and how we extract data. And then um, the third part is rock mass classification. And the last part is the, um, the real-time design where we update the design. And we also show an interesting example where we uh, successfully predict the collapse in advance. So the first part is the digital twin uh, model based on the virtual view photogrammetry. The photogrammetry itself is not new and has been start to use in the tunneling already um, uh, one decade, two decades ago, people start to search it for already. And uh, traditionally you, you need to have a platform, you need to have um, uh, calibrated optical parameters, which, which is quite long and not so flexible. So we've tried it already, um, like starting from 2010, uh, we have a um, project in Western China. So we start with binocular photogeometry, and then with our research um, going on, and, um, um, we have developed this digital twin technique. Um, and nowadays we can, uh, we don't need to use the platform with a sliding rail, with a very rigorous um, optical, um, calibrations in advance, but instead we can use our handy like um, iPhone or iPad, which is quite uh, practical on site. And um, also regarding the questions, maybe I can mention briefly here, people are concerned about how do you take photos um, effectively? It's quite dusty in the tunneling condition. Um, it is true, and uh, but in the tunneling process, um, after the explosion, we have the ventilation and marking, marking out the um, the stones 
And then during the ventilation, um, um, it's less, um, the condition is much better for the visibility. So um, in that time, we also have our portable uh, light and uh, the lighting system is also there in the construction site. So basically you can see the uh, picture quality is very good and we can uh, successfully recognize the joints. So that comes to the recognition in the slide. Then we have uh, four steps of 3D cloud model reconstructions. So we first take the original photos, then we um, do the um, feature point detection. So we have uh, built the, um, um, the point clustering and build up the local network to identify the outer normals, and which I will explain also later. Then we have the polar correction and the reorientation of the joint information. Then we also, because we have um, different photos in different angles, so we need to have dense match and display uh, um, disparity map generations um, because you have different angles and different photos. As long as these photos, they have sufficient density and overlapping, and, uh, the information can be uh, reconstructed. We also have uh, validated our correctness and how consistent is our results. Um, I also have supplement slides regarding the questions you proposed uh, to me this morning. So, so that's the basic four steps. And then um, you can see we can reconstruct the digital twin model based on the photo geometry just by cell phone camera or pad. And then you can see um, the, the photos are finally connected at different mile ages. So here is what I mentioned. If you want to identify the geological data, which is used for our rock classification later on, we need to know what is the orientation and what is uh, the outer normal, um, what is the trace length, trace spacing, all these detailed informations. So um, this is showing the procedures, how we based on the RGB point cloud to reconstruct the data and to show the, for example, the orientation of the structural plane. And um, then this is the uh, joint trace identification. As we know in, um, in the rock, um, rock joint classification, you need to know um, um, specific data like spacing, angle, orientations. So um, in our code, we can um, collect these feature points and then uh, build the network and then identify uh, the trace segment uh, parameters. So we can automatic um, extract um, the, um, um, uh, the joint geological information. And we have the so-called Eulerian-based contraction algorithms to um, identify this information. And that's the first highlight. And the second highlight is how we can um, identify, um, extract uh, these data. This, uh, automatic geological structure identification and data extractions. So we have 2D um, trace spacing based on automatic scan line algorithms that you can see. So based on our digital twin models, you can first um, you can further um, extract the information, for example, the scan line. And here is a 3D uh, structural plane spacing based on the group parallel assumptions. So once you have the 2D model, you can do the extension in the 3D. And um, here is we, according to the International Society for um, Rock Mechanics, um, there are uh, uh, like JCR value, joint roughness uh, coefficient values, and there is aperture identification. And these parameters will be used uh, in the later part, how we analyze the stability of tunnel. So these will provide the physical information. So before uh, the geometric information is one ex uh, aspect we know only the geo informa geometric information uh, is not sufficient. We also need the physical information. And the third highlight is intelligent rock mass uh, quality classification based on the mobile cloud. So our data is collect collected on site and we have a portable wireless AP access point in the tunnel. And uh, we set up the network as the construction phase is moving on. And then uh, we continuously, um, at each excavation surface, we um, upload these photos onto our server. And the server is based in Shanghai. Our tunneling projects is um, over the country in China. 
And then these data can be uploaded on our cloud system that you can see on the right hand side. And then that can um, quickly help us to analyze what's rock mass quality. And of course, um, in the design institute or um, design company, they already um, have a classification before the tunneling, start, uh, tunneling starts. And that's basically based on the um, geological exploration data. And, um, but um, what we are doing is we have the real time data that is giving um, the supplementary information, which is um, helping us to updating um, because the spatial uh, variance of rock joints can be um, very different from what we expected at the designing stage. And we also show some cases where um, in the de designing stage, the rock classification is type three, while later on we figure out a site, um, we correct the design and update the supporting system and make it class four. So this is the um, rock classification. Everything is on the app. So the customer service is on the app. Um, you can use the iPad handy to do that. And here is the uh, menu. BQ um, means the basic quality. Uh, so these are the indexes. And RMR is the uh, rock mass rating system. And GSI is recommended um, um, internationally for the geological strength index. So um, one can also cross um, verify to see uh, different indexes, what is the feedback finally um, for the rock classifications. And um, they, 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 can, uh, they can be um, site proof for, um, you can refer to different uh, classification system for site proof. And this is automatic overall classification uh, results that you can see for one example tunnel surface. And also um, together with the classification, there are also um, data behind that. The user can also see it on the pad. Um, this is the um, automatic local classification because um, at the excavation surface, maybe there's, um, there's a big variance of the joint spacing, maybe some part um, like the roof part or the floor part, and they are different rock um, quality, rock classification. and um, we can adapt our design uh, across a, a tunnel cross section um, differently like according to the condition. So it makes sense that we have also further window division, different zoning, we call it here six zoning or nine zoning, where we can see more details um, of um, the rock classification at different positions. And um, this uh, rock classification information is um, updated along the excavation uh, directions. So as tunnel explored and the first part is our automatic tunnel supporting design update and verification. So there are two parts. It's the first is the systematic design according to the rock classification. Second part is um, you want to adjust your design locally for some part which has the key block uh, identified as um, the dangerous potential falling part. So we need some analysis tool. So we use the GZZ criterion developed by our um, group head, uh, He Hua Zhu. So uh, it's called generalized uh, Zhang and Zhu model. It's recommended also by the International Society for Rock Mechanics. Um, an extension of Hook Brown model, but more uh, practicable uh, for the uh, rock mass um, classification engineering. So here is the comparison between GCC and Hook Brown uh, criterion for the model for the failing criterion. Here is the um, supporting design updating examples in our uh, cloud system. So uh, we carry out both the um, quick analysis, which is based on the local discontinuous discontinuous analysis to identify the block, and in case of need, we can carry on more detailed analysis. It takes about one hour, while this um, falling key block analysis is much faster. So because that then involved um, the entire model continuum analysis, it only involves the identification of the rock joint and uh, contact analysis. And here you can see, as I mentioned, you can have different zoning and you can have the road, a local boat design updating according to where it is needed. So, um, this is the, the further example that we show on the site. As I mentioned also in the video about this time last year, 
um, like in early uh, November and December, we uh, predicted the collapsing, collapsing cases in the afternoon and next day morning um, around lunchtime. And it's actually where we predict the left part has the, um, the falling block. So this is the video showing uh, the data on the site. And okay, just a moment. Yeah, so um, it's on the left-hand side. I think I showed in the video that um, there's this potential risky area. Okay, so yeah, I'm at the end of the short uh, overview of uh, my project. And thank thanks. Thank you thank very much time. for this very interesting presentation, even more as I'm not a rock mechanic specialist it was for me much more interesting that your presentation than when i looked at the video because then it was more more precise and so on so we probably will have many questions on this presentation so thank you very much yeah i'm very happy to listen to your questions so we'll go now to uh, the next uh, presentation uh, with uh, dr maxwell unmute you can hear me okay now yeah we can hear you okay we don't, we okay don't so let you, me but... uh, let me just share a screen share that one and let's see if this comes up yes okay um so an admission to make uh i hadn't realized actually i was going to be presenting our video on the screen so that was a video this is a, a presentation which is slightly different from the, uh, the video that was uploaded to you, but essentially says says the same things. So we're going to be talking- Because uh, uh, we can't see you. Your photo is not coming. No. Oh. Sorry. Let me show video, just a moment. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, just one second. Maybe I'll, I'll stop showing my screen, first of all. Uh, video. Yeah. How's that? That's better. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's Hello. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. All right. Okay. Okay. So, so just to go go back over this. So, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, an application of a, a platform called Mission OS uh, in Singapore on the deep tunnel sewage scheme phase two. And um, as I said, uh, this is going to be a slightly different presentation from the one that was uh, was uploaded because that was a video with me talking. And you don't want me talking twice, so uh, I'll be showing you a. A presentation that uh, essentially says the same things but in a slightly different way. So this is the DTSS2 project as seen on the uh, the stems, the shaft and tunnel excavation monitoring system in uh, in Singapore. And you'll see the size of this. This is basically half of uh, half of Singapore uh, down here on the on the screen. I'll actually show you a little bit about the system at the end, uh, but this is the sort of the size of it. And to, just to show you the uh, uh, this is a, a, a uh, a management screen that's in the executive boardroom of the DTSS2 project run by uh, the Public Utilities Board of Singapore, where all of the contracts can be viewed in, in one place. And just to give you a little bit of a, a flavour for what's being covered here, there's 100 kilometres of tunnels on one project. And we've got 50 kilometres of, uh, of, of TBM run from 73 shafts with five main TBM contractors with six uh, monitoring contractors on that job. And there's 20 TBMs, um, all recording to the system at sub five second latency. Uh, and all, all at one stage, we're on the same system at one time. We've got four vertical shaft, shaft sinking machines, uh, many pipe jacks uh, on the link sewer contracts with three over 300 shafts. Uh, and there's 12 contractors and three IMS uh, independent monitoring consultants there. Um, in total, we've got around about 35,000 instruments uh, on the job and increasing by the day, uh, approximately 300 CCTVs also into the system. As you can see, all the CCTV access is available by, by one platform. We've got over 900 users, and uh, well, I'll be showing you some statistics. Um, of those 900 users, almost every day, five or 600 of them are active, uh, and this has been a very key part of uh, business continuity during the COVID crisis, the fact that everybody can get to their data uh, as, they, as they need it. And then one really useful criteria, there's 75,000 pages of PDF that are being created by the, by the platform in a completely automated manner. And none of them 
I believe, need be printed off, which is a, a real, and this is the same at Melbourne Metro. We're also doing 40,000 there and no printing. So there's quite a bit of a, a saving in terms of environment going on with regard to the, the platform. Uh, and what is the platform? It's a, a, a fully integrated, con totally configurable technical data system for construction. And it just to sort of put this word map, uh, which sort of describes exactly what it does, the, the key focuses of the PUB here were in, I'm just going, uh, were in looking at risk management that's been able to recognize uncertainty within tunneling and to be able to manage the data so that that can be uh, identified and uh, mitigated at any particular time. Then there's the element of productivity. So being able to look at where's the time going, shift reports, the records, linking it back to what's been going on site and looking at opportunities to do things, do things better. Single source of truth for all of those two different types of, of data. But ultimately, it's all about knowledge engineering, making sure that you've got a common data environment where things are going to come in and where you can use this data for future works going forward. And in terms of the kind of things that the system uh, uh, really focuses on, clearly automation of processes, making sure that things can be done in real time, process flows can be accelerated and everything is accessible. And the, the objective really is that all the engineers on the job can be focused on doing things like analytics, forecasting, planning, and communicating. So we've really reduced the length of time for meetings. We've got fewer meetings uh, and a lot less preparation time. In terms of the, uh, uh, the kind of data, all of this kind of data is being all now tracked inside one system from everything from ground investigation information, boreholes, instrumentation, QAQC, all of this kind of thing. Uh, and here it's not just about the tunnels, but also about the heavy civil, the, uh, the shafts and the excavation all being done in, in one environment. And um, whilst we're in the uh, uh, production phase here, uh, we were brought on quite early such that we can actually bring in the influences and the predictions uh, that are uh, always important when you're trying to sort of track a project. And then down here in terms of the monitoring, we're tracking monitoring, not just for the instrumentation, but also for the, uh, uh, against the, uh, the predictions for the construction progress. So we can see exactly what's been influencing the job. And part of the systems will be there to feed into the performance of the works once they are commissioned so that people can go back and see exactly what happened when it was constructed to be able to understand its, uh, its um, uh, performance in the future. So um, why do we do this? Well, our key mantra here is that each of the, all of this data once collected becomes an input into your next project. So by keeping it alive, we can reduce the risk in each project that uh, companies do uh, or, or government organizations do. And over time, we're reducing the risk in, in business. And the direct sort of tangible benefits of this are that we have seen in the past on several other projects are obviously reducing insurance premiums uh, through um, demonstrating active risk management. And I'll show you an example of that on the, on the project. Being able to reduce uh, the manpower on projects through automation. And a lot of the automation of the reports has reduced the amount of time. You'll see that the, uh, the job has got a, a, got a small uh, uh, manpower footprint on it, which is, which is great. People are very efficient at doing the works. Uh, we can uh, also support alternative designs. I was, I was grateful to be on a presentation by uh, uh, the BCA uh, who showed seven examples where observational engineering had been implemented in uh, Singapore recently. And six out of those seven implementations were on the DTSS2 project. Okay. Um, we have reduced the carbon footprint, uh, obviously 50 or 70, in this case, 75,000 pages per month not being printed and collaboration online means less travel. Business resilience uh, is in, in the light of the footprint. The project, the deep tunnels of the, of the project are actually on program, I'm told. Uh, and that is uh, it's part in because of the ability of people to have carried on working on the job, even though they couldn't physically be there. And uh, there are reduced occurrences of failure. I think in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the paper we put forward uh, previously in Singapore, uh, back in the DTSS, not DTSS, in Northeast Line, I think one per kilometer in terms of sinkholes was common. And uh, now on the, uh, the current jobs, we're looking at uh, 
you know, maybe one per tunnel. I think there's been maybe one or two on the entire project. That's in 100 kilometers. Uh, the same was true of the Singapore Power Cable Tunnels uh, that were uh, that preceded these these jobs. The other benefits that uh, that are here are um, there's just an increased confidence through risk management. The data is all out in the open. There's a transparency. There's an ability to do to increase capability with people. They can all do analysis in real time that they used to take weeks. We have an example of a canvas preparation where people can create uh, um, dashboards into the data and they can, uh, they can create anything and it will automatically be, be updated. There is a, uh, an ability to, uh, keep, as I say, keep this data alive for, for use in the future. Uh, and in time, we will be using the, these jobs to close out some of these contracts uh, uh, in the future. Um, making better use of engineers. Uh, clearly, you know, we don't want engineers to be cutting and pasting. Now, all that cutting and pasting and pre pre preparing reports is gone. And people can actually spend most of the time doing their, uh, their feedback on what's actually happening on the job. And the system has a, a very effective way of using blogging technology set to deal with events. And uh, the events themselves may be through alarms. And the system helps people to, to uh, deal with the, with the alarms. Now, I'm going to show you some statistics for this, uh, this project. This is, the, uh, this is the DTSS2 project here. This is the normalized average monthly logins, normalized by tunnel dollar value per meter against a number of other projects, okay, in globally, actually. And one of the things you can immediately see here is because of the collaborative approach that's been adopted on the project, both with the PUB and with the, uh, uh, the contractors, Everybody is engaged. You can see across, across the somebody somewhere, and these, these other projects, these early projects, was not engaged in the job. Here we've got high usage and very, very high engagement in the use of, uh, of the system. So that um, uh, reflects on the fact that the systems were engaged at a very early, early stage, and they've become the common data environment for the, uh, uh, for the, for the project. Okay, so uh, how long have I got? About three, three minutes. Yeah. Just to show you a, a couple of things uh, about the system, if I can let's move this over here. So here is, here is the system. A couple of things to, uh, to show you. We have uh, dashboard, dashboards in here where you can see the information about the, uh, uh, the project. Over here, you can see here is all of the... Uh, the data related to the uh, uh, to the job. Uh, some other things that uh, I can show you if I could just zoom into a particular maybe a project. Uh, if we go to a map in here, I click on that. My screen is frozen. Okay, my screen is frozen. Okay. Coming into the blogging, blogging areas here, you can see that we have a lot of the alerts and alarms that are uh, generated on the job are, are sent into this blogging area where we can uh, I'll just load the blog. While that's on here, we can go into uh, CCTV and we can show CCTV. Uh, let's go to another shaft. Which are down here, if I load the dashboard. Okay, you can go and see, very simply, we can go and see TBM. So very quickly, we can get up the basic details about the job from, from video cameras to the summary of the link to alerts and alarms that go off. Uh, the idea that for, from these alarms, people can actually provide commentary on them, which they do all, all the time, and, uh, and close out the alarms very quickly. All the reporting on the events that go on on the job is, uh, is automated and uh, very, very simple to, to, to use. So everybody is using the platform. 
Obviously, we have uh, uh, TBMs, which are, this is actually currently in mid-ring. Uh, so it's all accessible to everybody. It's run through a hierarchy whereby only certain people can see certain, uh, certain elements uh, of, of the job. And uh, the, the, uh, the logins are all tracked, all the data is tracked. Anytime a data is changed, it's all tracked in, in the platform. So I just want to give you a very, very quick view to show you it's not just all pictures, but it is a, a function in reality. Okay, so that's my presentation. Uh, like I say, apologies, it's a slightly different one that was actually within the, uh, uh, within the uploaded one, which is a sort of video, but uh, I hope you get a picture for, uh, for where the systems are uh, and how they are implemented on the project. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Angus. It was very, it's very impressive. Just remember when I started working in tunneling by the channel tunnel and then at that, at that time internet did not exist and nothing was existing. So the only way you had to know what's going on was to go on site uh, <laughs> to share. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Let's go to the next presentation uh, on uh, also the use of uh, new means. Uh, virtual master rings replacing a tradition uh, with Jonathan and Alexander. I don't know who will do it. I'll, I'll, I'll yes, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, Olivier. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I think uh, I will lead the presentation along with uh, Alexander Saylor as a support, Alexander Hiller as a support to my presentation. Please confirm that you can see my screen. I will share it now. Yes. Okay. Just go in full screen. Yes, let's go to full screen. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, um, so good afternoon to everyone. And thank you uh, to be nominated in the Zeta Tunneling Award 2021. It's a pleasure for us. Uh, the presentation from today, it will, it will lead the one we use in the video, uh, but just summarize. Okay, I will present it. I'm Jonathan Rodriguez Marcos, regional sales manager, West of Europe and South America in the GMBH. And Alexander Hiller is with, with us as well. He is the head of industrial measurement. Okay, and teacher will present through the video all the technical part. Okay, uh, just to summarize, uh, we as a BNT are a donor company from the Hackness Group. Uh, based on digital solutions, okay? Uh, this presentation, it will be divided in, in four chapters. So talking about the performance specification, so by meaning the, the state of standards nowadays, uh, then go to a comparison in between the master and trial ring in the traditional way and in the virtual ring uh, in the virtual way, okay? So uh, then I will hand over this uh, technical procedure to Dieter to explain how the system performs this measurement. And for, for the last point, we will uh, talk about the case of study in Thames Tideway Tunnel, uh, where we have implemented these solutions. Okay, in terms of performance verification, uh, there are five main points uh, or five main reasons why to specify these high tolerances. Uh, here, I, I want to make a break just to uh, highlight that there is a lack of, uh, let's say, standards in performance specification uh, in tunneling. Uh, there are some guidelines uh, from an uh, association as BTS, or this one, International Tunnel Association, that really leads uh, and gives a, a good understanding of uh, what kind of specifications uh, should be used in the, in the 3D measurement of segments. And the reason why uh, I think it's good to highlight it because at the end, these elements are also designed on loads, okay? And, and then if we, we are not, in, if we can't ensure that this, the final geometric shapes of the segments will fit the initial design, then this will be affected for the high loaded effects as a water jacket forces and ground temperatures. So we can see, as, as, as we can see in this picture, I think a, a picture can show what the result is of, uh, of uh, going out of tolerances in the, in the SIPs can lead us to. Okay, then there's also some parts that we cannot see. This is something that is visible, but from the stratus part of the segment, there could be some damages 
that will not be detected as well once this segment is installed. Okay. Um, no one wants to have this situation in the tunnel because we know uh, those situation is also uh, very costly and, and time consuming in the long term. Okay, um, so uh, let's say uh, this is the traditional way that we all know how to erect a master or trial ring. Okay, and again, a picture give a very good understanding of what it takes to build up such a, such a big uh, operation. Okay, in this case, okay, it's a big diameter, it's around 19 meters. It's a, in these are different plates that we have been as well involved, but this can give us a dimension of what is the effort and the cost that uh, all the parties involved uh, has to put on this uh, to build up um, a tradition, actually, I'll call it to build up a tradition um, to, to prove uh, th those segments are inside of the tolerances. Okay, so we see it's required personal scaffolders, uh, cranes, and a lot of uh, controlling of uh, safety personnel following out these activities. Um, so we were asked uh, in the past uh, to measure one of these uh, mastering, okay? So uh, we, we took our device and our uh, software and our expertise to do to perform such measurements. And the output of, of such measurement, uh, it was that uh, there was some ovalization uh, by building up uh, such master rings, okay? So we can see it on here that we are almost exceeding the tolerances. We are talking tolerances around 10. So we are in between or almost exceeding the tolerances. And this is not uh, due to uh, the, the segment by itself. It's due to the constructive method of erecting this master ring, okay? And, and this is proof, if, if I go further, uh, this was proof uh, later on uh, doing an alternative uh, virtual rim build. Uh, let me explain at the end what we do is we measure uh, segment by segment, okay? And then virtually we make, you, we make the, the best match uh, of all of them, okay? So we can come up uh, with, a, with the currency of, of one. So we're talking about so one millimeter. So we're talking about uh, almost eight, seven, eight times better than, than the, the physical constructed ring. Uh, so in terms of precision, it makes clear to us uh, that uh, this is not a good uh, way to prove uh, the, the precast element uh, accuracy. But in addition, as we have seen, it's also a lot of work in top that it has to be performed to come to the point uh, to prove uh, this, this measurement, okay? Um, just to explain a little bit more in detail for, for the technical procedure, I will just uh, play the video directly uh, from Dieter. Please, uh, if you don't hear the sound, I've, I have activated, but so you should hear it now, but let me know, okay? Hello, my name is Dieter Loh at VMT. I am the lead engineer for the business of mold and segment measurement, which I will present to you today, including the virtual ring build. For this uh, business, we have the three components of the instrument, which is a laser tracker. We have the object, which in our case is a segment example, and we have the software part. So portable laser trackers are used to measure large scale objects, jigs, molds, assemblies, so that the operators can compare the actual size of their object with a nominal cat. This is done by using a triple mirror, which is followed by the laser beam and the 3D coordinates are measured and I can move the reflector across the object of interest. <clears throat> we are using uh, Premier Metology software for large scale applications adopted for this specific task of mold and segment measurement. We need this, these individual segment measurements for the virtual ring build. I will start a little example of this segment measurement and I will measure these circumferential joint. 
while I'm moving, the laser is following and the software can cover hundreds or thousands of points. Okay. When the measurement of all uh, objects, contact planes on the longitudinal joints, circumferential joints, and both cylinders are finished, I perform the calculation and reporting. And as a result, we receive this report, which shows all required criteria specified for your project. On the first page, we have the linear dimensions like the segment width is, the thickness and the arc length is, as well as the radii. On page two of the report, we have all important angles, the so-called border angles between the planes and the cylinders. And here we have the ang ang angles of the longitudinal joints between these planes. So when we have measured all segments of a ring, we can do the so-called virtual ring build. I will explain the technical proce procedure of this. So the 3D results are combined mathematically for adjacent molds and segments to present the assembly of the ring. This is called virtual ring build. It is realized through so-called relationships, which is a powerful method for dynamic inspection, alignment, and virtual fit. These relationships are not physical objects, but a defined link between two objects or between two related entities. The relationships calculate distances between objects and recalculates the distance whenever either of the items are moved. I will show this uh, calculation in a video. So here for this specific task, we have relationships for the measured points to the nominal cylinders, and we have relationships from the measured points to the adjacent actual longitudinal joints from the neighboring segment. When the calculation is running, we see that the numbers of the 3D translation and rotations are changing due to the effect that no physical overlapping is allowed in a ring but we have to move the segments that they are only touching and we get remaining gaps. So here we see the deviations before the virtual ring build. And here we have the result after the virtual ring build with no overlapping. We can zoom in here in into this example, A6 and A4. Before the virtual ring build, we have an overlapping. Here the red ones are overlapping, which is not possible in the physical world. And after the virtual ring build, we have no overlapping anymore, but only see the remaining gaps here and here. And here the two segments are touching each other. This was a quick overview of the 3D measurement of molds and segments and the virtual ring build combining these individual measurements. Okay, taking over after all this technical explanation and just to summarize, uh, at the end, uh, we are talking about enormous saving in cost and time. Also in terms of safety, safety avoiding accidents and on-site personnel. Of course, we have already proved uh, the currency of one measurements against the traditional method. And in addition to it is a very important point that has been proved that segment that I mainly is sitting at the tolerances once they are combined in the ring can still meet the ring build tolerances, which means uh, there is uh, less segments where they have to be rejected. Okay. Um, in the case of study, uh, so we talk about Thames Tyway tunnels. This is a sewage system that uh, means to upgrade uh, the sewage from London City that it was uh, 150 years old and designed for half of the population they have nowadays with a total of 25 kilometers and a depth in between 32 to 60 meters depth, okay? And in, in this case, uh, we've been involved in all the parts, 
but uh, we will talk about the, the east part. So the load east, the C415, where the specification says that uh, it must be erected uh, an inch valor not exceeding 0.5% of segment production, and then compare against the, the master ring. So if we use uh, this as an example, uh, we will end up with a, with a construction of 30 trial rings. Uh, as you can imagine, and if you saw in this picture, is is a lot of um, a lot of work to be carried on to build up all of this uh, with all the subsidiary activities that it belongs to them. So thanks to the open mind and flexibility on Taiwan owner and the biggest producer, so we end up with a solution of building up only two rings, and so master rings and the other twenty eight virtual rings also uh, to be compared. Uh, which is a significant uh, saving in terms of cost of production uh, for all the parties. And I think uh, a very good solution for a long-term tunneling project. So just to, to finalize, uh, thank you for keep us as a, as a nominate um, in this ETA tunneling network. So you have all contact details. I think we go through the questions uh, later. So feel free to ask any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And as you said, we'll come back with questions on this very interesting uh, aspects and probably uh, cost-effective uh, aspect of uh, the, this solution. So let's go now to the ODIVE Pro services decompression procedures monitoring with Julien Adler and Axel Barbo. Please. Uh, can, you, can you see my screen? And yes, we can see your screen. And you can hear me as well. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. We are very happy to be part of the finalists of the IT Tunneling Awards 2021. So today's presentation, we'll be focusing more on the actual study case we have performed with Imperia uh, Lyon, Imperia uh, France on the Lyon uh, tunneling uh, site. And uh, we will just have a quick, uh, quick view of the physiology behind the compression sickness. So as a reminder, we, we have developed a, a sensor, Doppler sensor, that is the result of 10 years of research and development and uh, has been the subject of four research theories and uh, four patents. So this Doppler sensor is made for microbubble measurement for hyperbaric, hyperbaric water after the intervention. And uh, so with this measurement uh, that they can perform in full autonomy, we are able to improve uh, operator safety. So the system is made with a sensor and a tablet with a dedicated app that is a bit for, for every customer so that is customized. Uh, I will demonstrate here. Previously, uh, in order to perform these measurements, Doctors were required on site. Hence, uh, it was not possible to have systematic measurement and uh, to monitor the, uh, the quality of the compression procedures on every site and for every worker. With our new solution, you can see that uh, the workers are now able within a few minutes to perform the measurement on themselves and no, no doctor is required on site. This is uh, how we can collect huge amounts of data for statistical analysis. So I will try. I don't know if you will be able to hear, but here, so we have example of the Doppler signal that, well, it will be difficult, <laughs> that you could uh, register with our sensor. So the first signal, I will just explain what, what is this. Sorry. Uh, uh, is uh, you can see the pulse and the venous flow. And for the second signal, there are a lot of bubbles here. So I, normally you should have been able to listen to these signals in the videos. 
that had been shared previously. Once these measurements are taken, the, uh, the recordings are sent on other system servers where they are being analyzed. Once this analysis is, uh, is done, uh, reports are made per periodically towards the clients to inform them about the quality of their decompression. And if needed, the decompression procedure can be optimized through either uh, decompression gas adjustment or duration extension. Then we work with the PDCA for plan, do, check, act, continuous improvement cycle. So here you can see, so we analyze the exposure severity of the intervention and the bubble level. Then depending on the results, if we are above the threshold, we increase the parameter so which is uh, uh, optimize the procedure. And then normally, so we should be able to see the impact of this optimization. And if not, we go through a new cycle of optimization. So now let's move to our case study. So this is the extension site of the Metro Line B in Lyon that has been performed with Impenia's team. So over 50 hyperbaric workers for more than 130 interventions and pressures so ranging from 0 0.75 bars to 2.2. So as you can see here, we have a lot of interventions and uh, without the other pro solutions, it wouldn't have been possible to monitor all of these interventions. With, uh, with our solution, so a simple training has been made and all the uh, interveners have been able to perform bubble measurement. Here you can see the periodical report that we issue towards the customer. So the signal quality distribution, this first graph shows that even without doctor, 90% of the signals are of good quality after a simple uh, training, so which means that the full autonomous the, yeah, the operators can work autonomously and perform their bubble measurement. And the second graph here shows the repartition of the bubble grade after the intervention. So we can see that even though 70% of the intervention led to no bubble, we have 3% of G3, grade three, and 5% of grade four. So these 8% of high bubble grade so that there can still be some improvement for the quality of the decompression procedure. And when we look at the table, we can see that these high bubble grades are mostly located in a 1.2 bar zone around 210 minutes. So the first table on the left shows the highest grade recorded for each decompression point. And the second table, which is the summary and the results of other system expertise of, uh, about decompression. It's an index that is calculated by other system about the quality of the decompression procedure. So we see that there are three, uh, three table points that require some vigilance. So now let's focus on this 1.2 bar intervention zone. So here on the graph, we can see that between 210 minutes to 270, even 300 minutes, some of the interventions led to high bubble grade. And we have observed uh, with the other systems database that the risk uh, between these, uh, for, for, for a given intervention, the risk increase between a decompression that led to no bubble and a decompression procedure that led to a high bubble grade is around, can be around 10. So there is a real need for monitoring these values and for helping companies lower the, the bubble grade after the intervention. The new, the innovative part so with this other system uh, or pro device that we can now take decisions based on objective measurements instead of previously just feelings. And we know so that operators were not well, fully aware or were not 
uh, always say that they had some uh, some decompression sickness symptoms. So now through this uh, systematical measurement, we can uh, apply proper countermeasures, such as the increase of decompression duration or the breathing of oxygen during the decompression. This uh, project, so we have worked together with Implinia and uh, they have highlighted so the simplicity of using the ODIVE system for an implementation on the site. And also what is very important for us is that they have highlighted the fact that the sensor and the solution has been welcomed by the operator who saw it as an opportunity to improve their safety. And also we work together with uh, MD Blondino Blanc. So she is in Penya's hyperbaric referring doctor and working for health uh, French uh, health uh, institution. And she saw this uh, ODI Pro tool as a, an improvement as uh, it, it was now, it is not possible to gather mass data for statistical uh, analysis. And uh, during this, uh, this uh, site, so this project, some intervention uh, procedure, so some intervention, we have optimized the, the compression and been, been uh, more vigilant. So this project has also been uh, showcased during the International Scientific Congress of Francophone Hyperbaric Medicine, and we received the first prize for the best poster by the Swiss uh, and Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society. Thanks, and uh, well, we are happy to answer all your questions in the second part. Thank you very much, Julien, for this presentation and on this uh, very important uh, aspect of safety in the tunneling works uh, when, you have, when we have hyperbaric intervention to, to do. And uh, it, it is one of the topics that has been studied uh, quite a lot by ITA through the Working Group 5, and I'm sure that uh, you can take part also in this work, in continuing work of the, of the ITA. Thanks a lot. Let's go now to the uh, next uh, presentation by uh, Nicola Valiente from WeBuild. Riacuerdo uh, Lote 3, innovative method for the construction of a CIF outfall project, the RISERS concept. Good afternoon. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, but not on full screen. You have to, 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 it's the, the wrong, it's the wrong screen, you know, by, it should be. Uh, I'm not, uh, oh, I have not idea how to, to manage in uh, Zoom. Uh, if you. Yeah. Okay. If you allow, I can. Uh, you present can here, 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 here. If you click where you were, you can click yeah. on the first in posizione di visualizzazione. Eh, el primo. Yes. Si, eh, no, el, yeah. The first uh, one. Yeah, this one. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, okay. I'm presenting an innovative construction technique, method, and equipment known as the riser concept, which is was developed and. Uh, used and applied for the first time in Rio Cielo Outfall project in Argentina. Uh, quick one on uh, marine outfall. Marine outfall are a gravity discharge system, which uh, basically release, uh, are used to release treated wastewater from a water treatment plant to the sea. And generally, uh, a conventional construction method make extensive use of uh, maritime activities, including maritime equipment and divers which uh, make uh, these the, uh, particularly complex and challenging uh, and uh, risky to the construction uh, of this uh, type of uh, uh, project. In particular, these are uh, the two focus where uh, we, uh, we drivers of the innovation that we developed was uh, were in fact to develop and to improve the safety during construction for, uh, for this kind of project, as well as to reduce the environmental impact related to, to these activities, in particular reducing the maritime works, which were as, uh, are associated with important uh, injuries and uh, um, and risky operation. 
the original uh, project from Biacello was a, a traditional uh, concept uh, cons uh, consisting in art artful tunnel, a transition shaft, and a diffuser section with deep foundation pipes and vertical risers. The alternative study that we developed were basically uh, eliminating some important part of, of uh, the works by extending the outfall tunnel and uh, uh, constructed in a vertical riser directly from the, uh, from the outfall tunnel using an upward jacking system. This solution basically is based on the bottom-up construction method uh, where uh, riser segments are jacked up from the tunnel upward to the riverbed and start already during the TBM tunnel construction with the installation of positional ring and launching ring, two special rings that are used to precisely position the displacement head and the riser uh, that has to be installed. Then uh, this, the next phases are disassembling of the TBM and assembling of the riser jacking equipment. Then uh, the jacking equipment is connected to the, to the riser segment and uh, the displacement head is jacked up uh, and uh, in continuously the excavation of the material is executed. Uh, basically, at the end of the checking of each one of the elements, uh, the, the riser uh, is plugged with a temporary barcode at the tunnel and the diffuser head is installed from, uh, from maritime activities. The advantage of this concept and in this method is a part to improve the safety condition, also to reduce the environmental impact, but in particular also to have impact on the, on the, on the schedule, the construction schedule, which become independent from maritime condition, improve the quality of the, of the works, and in general, to lower the overall cost of the project. Uh, just a quick, uh, some quick uh, detail of the, of the method. Uh, basically, as I mentioned before, uh, the method starts with the construction of special rings where uh, the riser has to, to be installed. Be, here you can see the keystone launching segment is a special segment including an openings from where the riser are, uh, are jacked up, a ceiling system, and as well uh, the installation of a displacement head which is pre-installed in this uh, uh, tunnel segment and then used uh, during the riser execution uh, and during the riser excavation. The, another detail is uh, this uh, displacement head, uh, which include hydro demolition nozzles, uh, discharge chamber, soil discharge line and valve to control the, the material excavated, and uh, is, was conceived to be dismantable in order to, uh, to easily assemble the, the diffuser head at the end of the installation. Another important element which was studied was uh, 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 and was developed was the, uh, the riser segment. Each riser segment uh, is each riser is constituted of 18 riser segment and the riser segment have uh, different uh, geometries and uh, have been studied and uh, they designed to, uh, with a compression capacity up to 400 tons and tension capacity up to 150 tons. So to achieve this uh, high tension capacity, uh, locking uh, spheres were used to join and connect to uh, the two elements of the, of the riser. The, the type of joint is a, is a bell and spigot connection, including two ring to, to improve and uh, to have redundancy on the ceilings, uh, ceiling and water tightness of this kind of joint. Additionally, a riser jacking equipment was uh, constructed and developed, designed and developed. Um, in particular, in the project, we used two riser jacking equipment working uh, con uh, contemporaneously. The riser jacking equipment include a riser transfer and a handling device to minimize the, the operation uh, requiring uh, manual operation. Then uh, include a upper stabilizer to control the, with a pipe break the, uh, the, the riser during the installation and to control also the verticality of the riser during the installation. A jacking capacity of 400 tons include a loading distribution system and 26 uh, active jacks, uh, which control the load transferred to the tunnel, to the segmental lining of the tunnel, and uh, hydro demolition pumps, uh, which uh, are used to, to excavate the material for, we, at pressure up to 300 bars. The only uh, maritime activities needed uh, with this method is the dismantling of the displacement end and the installation of the diffuser. And these, uh, 
uh, improve a lot uh, all the all the safety and uh, constructability of the of this kind of project. In particular, the the development of this uh, innovative solution required an extensive uh, testing, uh, the construction of prototype, to design testing phase, which uh, was uh, uh, was um, was um, involved uh, was involved uh, for uh, almost two years for for us. It was uh, very very demanding. Uh, we made the sailing system test, the displacement test to measure the hydro demolition system and then the checking capacity, the rise segment test to verify the coupling of the rise uh, element, and as well all the development and uh, testing of the equipment. And concluding with a real size test. The result of this uh, uh, very accurate testing phase was uh, that during construction, uh, basically, we installed uh, 34 riser, one kilometer of riser segment. Uh, in 50 days, uh, less than half the expected uh, estimated time. And this was, the result was even ab ab above our expectations. Uh, very quickly going to the conclusion, the riser concept uh, in the Asholo project is, uh, showed uh, to be practical and uh, to have many advantages in terms of construction. It is a sustainable uh, construction technique which improves safety and reduces environmental impact uh, as well uh, provided advantage in terms of time and the quality and cost, and represent an engineering innovation that changed the way the, to construct riser. And in particular, the, the in construction industry has not uh, developed the main innovation in the recently in terms of methodology of, of construction. And this uh, system applies specifically in the field of uh, construction methodology rather than processes and uh, represent a step forward in future uh, outfall project. Just uh, concluding, um, the construction technique and method developed that was never uh, used before, and this is our first time. Uh, the construction outfall project without using extensive marine activities uh, is also a uh, first time and uh, achieved uh, with this uh, technique. The vertical upward of pipe jacking and excavation from inside an underwater tunnel is also a first time and never made before. Um, here, uh, as you saw, uh, the, we developed a tunnel cement line, including openings for pipe jacking without the need to perforate the tunnel lining. This is never made before, as well as uh, uh, an, uh, a breakthrough into uh, underwater with the dismant underwater dismantling of the of the of the displacement head. The key drivers and the key elements of this innovation are uh, the innovation is related to construction field and construction method and equipment. It, it allowed the automation of the construction steps. Basically, there are very few activities that have to be made manually, but most of the construction activities are, are made uh, with a, auto, by automation or by using the jacking equipment and all the tools that have been developed. There is a significant reduction of risk and also as a consequence a reduction of the environmental impact because most of the most critical activities related to uh, maritime works are drastically uh, reduced or eliminated. And uh, the innovation provided is basically to replace a traditional method with an innovative and advanced technology. With this, I've concluded my quick presentation and I'm available for any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. Now we'll go to the panel discussion. So uh, with all the finalists, we have uh, two uh, members of IT Executive Council, uh, Jayatan Kumar Asami from Singapore and uh, Andres Marananda from Colombia, and we have two members of a panel of judges, Shani Willis and Bob Goodfellow. So a lot of people to ask very precise questions or having a more general discussion. So maybe uh, Jaya, you want to start? Yeah, thanks, uh, Olivier. Um... So maybe uh, I will just uh, start with the first uh, presentation uh, by Professor Hua Huwei. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, on, yeah, hi. Um, okay. Can I clarify uh, in terms, I think it's a very good presentation. A lot of work has been done in terms of uh, 
know, identifying the uh, uh, using the photogrammetry in order to model uh, and the geotech, uh, geological model and then to work out um, the uh, designs uh, for the support system and so on. So I have uh, two quick uh, clarification uh, I would like to ask. Uh, uh, one is in terms of this photogrammetry, as I understand that in order to get a reasonably good uh, accurate modeling, you probably need to have certain amount of overlap uh, between the images and also the photo taking shall be taken at a certain um, uh, angle. You know? If you are too oblique, uh, you probably may not get a very good um, uh, accurate uh, modeling. So in your project, uh, be, you are basically taking the tunnel face, yeah? Uh, and therefore, in terms of taking photo taking, is there any, uh, any, uh, um, uh, any uh, approaches that you have to apply in terms of taking the photograph? Is there any kind of um, guidance uh, for the people who are taking the photographs? So that is one question. The second question I would like to clarify, uh, these are mostly um, numerical analysis. Uh, after you have the geotechnical model, then you are basically carrying out your numerical analysis to find out the support system and so on. But obviously uh, all uh, the uh, mind um, tunneling, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, aspect of the actual field monitoring, and then you modify your support system and so on. These are the traditional way of doing things that uh, you observe and then you apply the, the support system accordingly and so on. So in this part of this um, research project, uh, have you all also look at the monitor data at the site uh, in terms of the, the deformation and so on, and then you improve your numerical analysis in order to better predict and then to come up with the, the support system design and so on. So these are two quick uh, clarification that I would like to clarify. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, let me answer the first question. Uh, you mentioned about um, the procedure for how to take the photos on site. So we have set up the entire gu guideline and um, like the lighting conditions um, also, um, the angles, as you can see in the photo geometry, um, you need to actually take photos at different angles, at different photo points. Therefore, you can have the comparison um, at different points. So in the early stages, um, about 10 years ago, first is we used binocular, we have different photo po focal point, we have optical parameters, calibrations, and then this takes quite a long time if you set up the distance to the faces and different angles. But how the question is how much precision we need. So it's the fundamental questions. So in, in the tunneling, um, as long as we know, for example, the tunnel, uh, the joint spacing. So the joint spacing is in the range, right? So the question is if the joint spacing is three centimeters or four centimeters or 4.5, how much is accuracy? So do we really need to exactly calibrate all the optical parameters? It really depends on the applications. So therefore, um, we can just um, here use the handy. Um, we can um, take photos when we stand in certain distance to the uh, tunnel face, then we can take photos at different angles. And then if, uh, if there is not sufficient overlapping of the photos, um, the, our app will have a, a warning a reminder that this area is not covered and then we take further photos. So there is a guideline, including the lighting system, the distance and the visibility and um, in which conditions that uh, the photo taking procedure should be done. So that's uh, the first question. So uh, the second question is, how do we update our real-time supporting design? So it is, um, it, it is there are two parts. The first part is, there is on-site manufacturing that is already routing in the construction. For example, the tunnel convergent uh, profile, the tunnel convergent measurement. So this is already routing that people need to do it. Um, it's, it's people, uh, need, the construction team need to do it in tunneling projects. And then they also need to use the uh, full station 
data and the um, um, uh, to and also they test the um, at the specific points the rock um, strength compression test on the site for every two to three days after few excavation surfaces. So these are the routine data. And our data, our measurement is a supplementary, it's a complementary to the existing um, construction data. So once we got feedback on the, from the construction data, for example, the tunnel convergent profile, then we can update the systematic tunnel support design. So there are two parts of the design. The first is systematic tunnel support. The second part is local support, where we identify the local um, key block the, the local um, potential falling points. So as I said, the rock classifications really um, determines how much is the cost for per extension meter for the, um, uh, for the support system. And I can um, give you an example for the class three to class five, and it, it can be huge difference for the waste of materials and for the waste of time. And the cost is really, um, we have seen lots of lots of um, unnecessary waste where the classification on the site is not based on the real-time measurement, but only based on the, um, the pre-data um, of the geological um, report. Geological report tells, okay, here's class four, then we do it everywhere, class four, class five. And the difference for class three to class five is 100 times more per meter for extension meter. So it's, as you said, it's really important that we know what is convergent curve for the deformation during construction and um, we get feedback from the compression test on the, they have the compact compression test equipment. So it's already part of the routine. So uh, it, our data is a complementary to the existing data. All right, okay, thank you so much. Uh, you. Olivia, maybe uh, others, okay. probably yeah. the other panel members probably may have uh, questions to her. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yes, I also had a question for, for Professor Swang. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, using uh, an artificial intelligence, intelligence based system if you have been able to calibrate the results of your analysis with the system with a previous project uh, that used more conventional and more manual methods to see the differences between the two alternative uh, uh, methods mm -hmm. yeah yeah thanks um, is that all the question or yes that's it okay thank you thank you for the question um validation verification uh, we are talking about here, very important. Um, um, we have two parts, the rational model, the physical model, for example, the joint orientation, um, the joint spacing, aperture, these are physical data. This is not based on artificial intelligence. So, and then there are also other parts. So um, if you want to, um, um, for example, have the quick design, quick, uh, quick online uh, calculation, you can use artificial intelligence. So for the verification validation, it's important. How much is our confidence of our data, physical data, are they correct? So we do two-step verification. First is uh, we print out three examples, this obvious geometry, shade, and then you can see where is the discontinuities. So our system can recognize these correctly. That's 100%. And then second part, how, how much confidence do we have uh, on the site? Um, how, how accurate it is, is we have two reference examples. The first is slop in 2010, second is lato in 2013. We use these reference examples to test how accurate is our system. So here you can see um, the validation data in this table. And then we also do um, compare on the, uh, on the site, as you asked, what is the menu, um, the menu RMR, what is our, um, predicted value. And then, as I said, there are different rock classification. BQ, basic quality, that's our national code. And GSR, and geological strength index, RMR is rock mass rating. Yeah, These are the two international GSI and RMR are in two international standards. So here is the Dongpo tunnel as example. As you can see across mile ages, they will accumulate different data. There are different rock classifications. There is manual ways, there are automatic ways how to extract it. And um, there is also um, comparison like the BQ with accuracy if we compare to the, um, uh, to the expert value. So we have, few, uh, we have also data, build a database to validate, for example, this, these mileages, um, we have expert look at these 
data, and then we take these as reference value com combined with menu measured data. So the BQ, we can predict 100% accurate with our system. GSI is 93%, RMR is 87%. As I said, there are different indexes. They can serve for each other as the cross-validation of that proof. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Thanks a lot. Doc Dr. Maxwell, you wanted to add something on this? Uh, yeah, it's just a quick question. I, I, I remember a, a tunnel uh, in Hong Kong underneath uh, the rockhead that was quite low that had two horizontal seams, one at sort of waist level and then another very soft seam at about uh, just above sort of head level. Uh, and then about a metre and a half was the roof of the tunnel, which actually was it appeared to be in relatively intact rock. <laughs> Um, obviously, you know, from a human perspective, we can say, OK, one, two, where's the next scene? It's above the tunnel. It's not actually visible in the crown. So how does your system, how can you build into your system something that, that gives that sort of, uh, say, extrapolation or forecasting uh, along those kind of lines? Mm. So we are talking about interpolation, extrapolation. So how, how accurate, it depends on the spatial um, 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 variability. So based on the previous mileage data and based on feedback on the site data, um, we can do extrapolation. So yeah, so that is possible. So um, we can always update our system, do the extrapolation to estimate it. So the question is, what is the variance of the space um, for the rock quality? So I hope I answered your question. So the extrapolation is possible, but we need to take into account of the uncertainties. It is always possible that we can do the extrapolation based on the previous mileages, what is the rock classification, and then how do we extrapolate it? So usually, um, actually, maybe it's good also to show an example if cushion is there, for example, yes. in Tibet Thanks tunnel. So. Yes, um, I, I can stop sharing. There is Tibet tunnel, um, Sergila tunnel. So there, there are people having also some, some cross section is a little bit surprised. So it's different from what they expected. So I don't know if Kirshen can share a screen because he just yeah. entered. Yeah, yeah. So this is like our cloud system. As I said, we have a custom end, customer end, which is based on the handy app. And then this is our cloud server where the data is uploaded. And then the dot you see there is, the red dot you see there is in Tibet. So I don't know if Kershaw can show the database where they have also pre-cast uh, pre classification. Sorry, this is in Chinese system. And because all the users are so far, it's, our, <laughs> it's Chinese. And so, well, um, there are predictions that is different from your expectations. Um, I think I saw previous Excel like database on this cloud where, as, uh, where the classification is updated, corrected from classification of uh, four to three. So it saves a lot of money, so which is unnecessary, yeah. So, um, um, yeah, I think the system is also maybe a sort of should be slow because he's using VPN and he, he cannot yeah, yeah. use the um, <laughs> Zoom directly. So sorry about it. It's okay. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know, Bob, Shani, do you have specific questions? Yes, Shani. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for really very, very good presentations. And it is evident that uh, the industry is very alive and very active in uh, developing these new innovations and techniques, both, both for the management of projects, as well as the actual building of them, which uh, is an, it's, it's wide in its scope. Um, for the uh, uh, innovations that are um, AI and data management, I'd like to ask, uh, who is who are the main stakeholders who have to adopt the new technology? Is it the client, the contractor, the consulting engineers? Um, who are the the main uh, parties to be convinced to 
adopt these new technologies. Um, and particularly, Angus, if I could ask, on the system that you employed on the DTSS, were the contractors voluntarily signing up to be part of the big data management system? Or was it um, a specification in the contract from the owner that this will be applied and there's no option, you will be in it? Thanks, Shani. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, question. And, and I'll fact, go back in time a little bit because uh, there was a bit of history behind where the DTSS STEM system came from. Uh, as you may know, we were engaged actually on the power grid cable tunnels, which was about 50 kilometers of tunneling in, in Singapore. Uh, and on that one, we were engaged quite early on as well. But in this case, as a part of a partnering exercise, the client actually went to the contractors and said, listen, we've got a great idea. We want to we want to partner for information in the same way that we partner for, uh, for, for the environment, we partner for safety. And we're going to build a charter around how to deliver this project efficiently and effectively with, with information, which they did. And as part of that, the contractors actually were requested will you pay for some of it? So in the end, all, all seven people, so there were six contractors and one, uh, one client, paid one-seventh of the cost of the system. And they put in place a, a, a steering committee which drove the implementation so that the system did exactly what they, they wanted during the course of the works. Now, uh, when it moved over to DTSS2, uh, the people had a little bit more time so what they did is they actually put the system in place before the main contracts were engaged, in which case they didn't build that element into the, uh, into the tender. Uh, so it was already there, but what they did do is they built in, built in an interface requirement uh, and then essentially had to sell the idea to the contractors. So the system being completely configurable, it, 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 everything in the system is built in a way, include the TBM screens, which, which is a sort of, a, I would say, a compromise, but it's, a, it's something that everybody had, had to agree to. Uh, and they all got the opportunity to collaborate. So I would say, yes, it was unusual for some of the parties to do things in this way, but ultimately I think the engagement has meant that they've saved a lot of time and effort in, in doing it. And there's a single source of truth, obviously, for the job. Mm. Um, thanks very much. Uh, as a supplement, what, is, what are the security measures for having such an amount of data uh, in in the cloud, uh, you know the security of the systems from either hacking or or um, mess up, let's say, mm -hmm. by a permitted user or by someone that's not associated at all with the project. Yeah. So, so uh, the the systems are first first of all they are all backed up on a daily uh, basis. And we also have uh, local mirrors for all of the all of the data. There's huge huge amount of information in there, uh, as you can can imagine accumulating. I mean, we've got something at like 200, 200 or 300 million records just of instrumentation data alone. Um, the security, obviously, every, everything is in the password protections. And there are a number of uh, requirements that the, uh, the the government departments put in regarding passwords and how people can can access the uh, the. Various users have different uh, capabilities in regards to what they can do when they access the system. So obviously administration all the way down to just read-only read -only users. Also geographically and in terms of capability, people have, are, are limited to only be able to see certain things, obviously related to their, to their contracts. Now, in terms of uh, the access through hacking or whatever, we, the systems are, are on professionally managed cloud, cloud servers, and these are tested on a regular basis what's called pen testing. So the idea is that there are uh, attempts are made by ourselves to, to penetrate the systems uh, externally so that uh, we can be assured that any loopholes that may, may be there are, are not there. Um, and then that is opened up to the clients themselves to, well, the information about, about that is open to the clients because they can be assured that that is there. Now, there are other things in there like denial of service attacks uh, that uh, we put in specific uh, um, implementations to 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 deal with. Uh, so yes, I mean you, you're right. It's something that we need to manage, and our uh, providers need to manage in order that be uh, be covered. Thanks a lot, Angus. Andres, you wanted to. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, my question for Mr. W Maxwell was along the lines of Mrs. Wallace, uh, and it's related. 
to the fact of the administration and, and fitting of those systems, which are quite demanding. And sometimes people are, become a slave of, of the system as a whole, and it's quite time consuming. So how do you, despite you, you highlighted several of the benefits and advantages of the system, how do you manage to really demonstrate to a new user the ROI of really investing all that time in the, in the benefit that you receive? Hmm. Well, it's, it's one, one sentence really is touch only once. Okay, so the idea is that, uh, you know, if you've seen, been on projects where you've been slaves to, uh, to Word and to Excel and everything else, you will often touch a certain piece of data several times uh, and it'll be passed around in files or whatever. So you're never sure that they've actually got is, is, is right. So the intention here is that the data is really, it's touched only once and that the data coming in the system goes through an audit process. Now that audit process is, is audit by exception. So the idea is, is you put in place filters and, uh, and capture into the system to be able to highlight things which deviate from uh, from expectation or from things which may be normal. And by highlighting that, it means you can deal with large quantities of information with a small team. To give you an example, um, the, uh, the, the whole of, let's say, let's say Melbourne Metro for a start, whole of Melbourne Metro, 40,000 pages of PDF reports and all the instrumentation is managed by one person. Okay, that's 13, 14,000 instruments on, on that job or more. Um, on the Singapore Power Cable Tunnels, there were uh, two technicians managing data over 35,000 meters of, of, of tunnel um, with, with some support from the IT people. So actually, once you focus it on really just auditing by exception, then the data you can allow the data to stream. So we try and avoid any kind of, you know, we take the data at source, no processing, the system does all the processing, uh, it just loads the data direct. Thanks a lot. Uh, the, the, on the on the Q and A, there is a question for for Nicola Valiente. Nicola, you want to answer? Oh yes. Read the, read, read the question and answer to it. Yes. Uh, was only the launching ring specifically designed for the jacking operation, or also the adjacent segment ring? Segment ring. Was there any monitoring of the tunnel ring structure during the jacking operation? Yeah, second reply. Basically, uh, I can share also uh, my screen again just to facilitate. Basically, um, we de developed the system to um, condivide the screen. Yes. Yeah. To correct the, 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 to precisely start the execution of the vertical riser by installing vertically the, uh, the launching segment, the, the segment including the displacement, the displacement head from where the riser would start to be installed. To allow this uh, correction placement and vertical correction placement of the displacement head, basically we considered and developed a system with which allow um, adjustment of the uh, correction of the TBM roll by using as positioning, positioning segmental ring with uh, we including slotted holes, which allowed to control, topographically control the position uh, achieved during in the roll of the TBM achieved at that stage of the tunnel ring assembling and correct, topographically correct and precisely positioning the, uh, the riser uh, keystone launching segment. Uh, the keystone launching segment uh, was adjusted with these slotted holes uh, and then topographically uh, monitored uh, during the uh, assembling of the ring and then after uh, during the construction of the uh, subsequent ring. Additionally, uh, the second ring is, is named launching segment ring and include the keystone launching segment, including the ceiling system and the displacement head used for jacking the riser. Uh, additionally, the riser jacking equipment is uh, uh, provided with 26 active vertical jacks, which are used to um, uniformly uh, transfer the vertical load along the tunnel uh, segmental ring. And this allowed to us uh, to control the deformation uh, on the on the tunnel. So all the system was uh, was, uh, co was developed to control effect during jacking on the tunnel and 
control of uh, jagging forces and verticality of riser during the installation. I hope uh, it was clear. Thank you very much. Uh, Jaya, then afterwards, Bob. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I just want to clarify on this uh, decompression procedure monitoring uh, by Julian. Uh, um, what was mentioned is that uh, the, the a lot of research has been done over 10 years uh, in terms of the sensor to monitor the, the gas uh, content in the body and things like that. So, but then uh, in this particular project, uh, it is not very clear to me what is the innovative part uh, that uh, has been done. Was it the sensor development or is it the interpretation of the data uh, or is it just the application part of uh, those uh, research previously has been carried out by others? Uh, probably Julian can clarify uh, the innovative part of uh, the uh, this particular procedure monitoring. Yeah, thanks. Yes, sure. Thank you for, for your question. So uh, first of all, uh, as we said that the, this solution is the result of 10 years of research and development. Indeed, so as a system uh, was funded in 2008 to address the problem of uh, decompression sickness and uh, to help improve hyperbaric uh, safety. Uh, so over these 10 years of research and development, we have analyzed huge uh, databases of hyperbaric intervention on one hand. So this is a, let's say the risk analysis. And on the other hand also, we have developed this uh, Doppler sensor. So the state of the art uh, before this sensor existed was the use of a medical uh, Doppler device. And that required uh, doctors to be on site to, to monitor the, the people. So the real you know, breakthrough innovation with our system is that now the operators are able to do self measurement easily in a connected way. And so we have several algorithms that are implemented in the app and our servers. So once uh, after the intervener has made the measurement, there is a first algorithm embedded in the app that analyzes the signal and says if the signal is of good, good quality or not. And if not, the intervener is required to retake the measurement. Then on the, so once the signal is uh, recorded, it is sent on uh, other system servers where a second algorithm so detects automatically the bubbles. So it comes the bubble and it gives automatic uh, bubble grade. Then we also have, uh, let's say an, indicate, an indicator that say that if the signal or the interpretation of the signal can have some doubt, then we have a human control and uh, one of uh, our experts will uh, listen to the signals and confirm the bubble grade and uh, if required correctly. This project so with Imprenia, it is actually the first time that we have uh, on a project uh, systematical bubble detection with no doctor on site. So this is the real innovation. And uh, now we, we are able, so with a simple, uh, so as you've seen, the sensor, the tablet, or the system fits in a case. So we can do what we do actually with our clients. We do uh, some uh, training with video conference, it is possible. And then we just ship this case on the site and uh, after we collect the, dat the data and we report directly to the hyperbaric manager and the uh, QHH team. So this is the, the innovative aspect. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thanks a lot. Bob? Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I think he may have just answered my question too, but I, mine, mine is a, a broader question to that each of the presenters uh, could answer in turn, please. First of all, thanks very much for the, the uh, presentation and also for all of your uh, application for this award. It's, it's been really inspiring to read so much uh, innovation going on. But my question is this, it's, a, it's a, a short elevator pitch, not on the technical aspects necessarily, but why your uh, 
uh, your nomination for this award is innovative. If you could just directly address the innovation and why do you think uh, you deserve the award because you've been innovative? Maybe you can take it in order of the presentations to respond. Uh, okay. Um, so we talk about real time design, saving materials, save the, uh, improve the cost many years. I think we, um, we, we are the first that realized on site um, the feedback and real time design to um, save the cost and improve the safety in an integrated systematic way for tunneling. Yeah. Okay, over to me. Yeah. Well, there are there are many systems out there, and they've been applied in uh, in various ways on on projects. It's the first time that uh, all all data really has been pulled into one project, uh, uh, into one system, or one project. And um, in, in particular here, as you can see in the number of users, this is the first time really that every party on a project has engaged at a very very high level in terms of using this information to deliver it. So there is really is truly a single source of truth on this project. Thanks. Thank you. Jonathan? Uh, yes, uh, just from my side, in terms of innovation, I think uh, it's not the innovation, uh, the sensor or the device by itself uh, for this kind of measurement, but rather the, the, the methodology data processing and matching algorithm. So if, if not going to, to the technical part, uh, just to say that this is interesting for all the parts involved, for the previous factory, construction company, and the project owner, in, in have a real and precise measurement of a precious element and, and really eliminating uh, from, from the future project uh, the use of uh, physical virtual ring that it doesn't have any accuracy, okay? And also it brings uh, a lot of uh, time, effort, and a lot of risk in, in safety terms. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So for other processes, so apart from the other technical aspect that I have described already, the real innovation is that it is the first time that uh, companies are able to have a proactive approach toward decompression sickness risk management. So previously, as there was no possibility to systematically monitor the, the interveners, uh, we had to react after, unfortunately, a DCS case occurred. Now we are, we are able to take some uh, countermeasures before this decompression sickness occurs. So, so this is how we can uh, improve the safety of uh, the interveners. Nicola? Yes, no, thank you for the question because I believe it's very important. In terms of uh, the RISER concept of Riachuelo, I believe uh, we all know that engineering innovation is quite limited in construction because uh, for many decades, uh, um, certain way to construct, method to construct uh, were always repeated. Or many, many often the clients re require to use uh, uh, same method adopted in the past because these are reliable. And uh, it's very challenging to move forward, uh, starting from this point and uh, introduce a new construction method, a new construction approach, which totally changed the way things are done. In uh, Riachuelo project, uh, the, the, the key drivers uh, were safety and uh, environment. Maybe some of you know that uh, there are uh, outfall tunnels, uh, such uh, like a Boston outfall tunnel where the world Many, many personal injuries and um, two persons died uh, due to the difficulty in constructing this kind of project. And uh, the evolution of the construction method is something that has to move forward because uh, we can uh, improve uh, the processes, the engineering processes, the design processes, but then there is a link that has to be made in between engineering and construction. Otherwise, there will be also, always something missing. And I believe the key driver and the reason why the Riachuelo uh, system, uh, the riser concept system is an uh, important innovation is because it changed totally the way things are done and uh, use a different approach. In my uh, 
a pre video reg presentation, I made an example, the false body flop. Uh, uh, the way things are done, sometimes are introduced a new method, a new solution that uh, from that moment uh, on, onward uh, change and uh, is adopted because it's safety, is improved the safety and improve also the quality and uh, reduce the cost. And this is a, a good example because it's proved is has been constructed without any accident and uh, in time, even short with a shorter the construction time than expected, and uh, is a, a valid example of what can be innovated not only in design but also in construction industry, in particular in tunneling, which is very dangerous and and uh, complex. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks everybody again. Any other questions? Yes, Shani. Um, yeah, all of these innovations and developments, they are all uh, proprietary. They have been developed by your companies and uh, your colleagues and universities and so on. How are these innovations to be made available to the wider industry? Is there a process or are you developing these strategies as well? And perhaps each of the entries uh, representatives can, can address the point. Thanks. That's some more tricky questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's often the case that, you know, the innovations are all there and they are used uh, within the sphere of the development and the user, the initial yeah. users or developers. But it's, it's getting these innovations adopted more widely mm. where the real benefit will, will start to be appreciated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know because it is one of one of the reasons we inside ITA we created the the IT ITA new technology committee in order to bring to the tunneling industry the new technologies that we know that it is difficult to bring new technologies, as Nicolas said, in 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 specifically in construction and maybe more in, in the tunneling, even though there have been a lot of innovation in the past years. We, we need to have something to bring these new technologies available for everybody once they are proven. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. can I answer this question yeah. from my side? Yeah, thanks, Shani. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think we met before Krona in Chuzhou Lang like um, some years ago. So, yeah, thanks for this question. So from my side, we um, I'm proud to say that we make our platform partially open source because what we are developing is a part of the IS3 system. I think Professor He Hua Zhu has made a presentation in ITA series uh, sessions yeah. before there is a lunchtime talk recently. So this is an um, infrastructure intelligence system that is being made open. So tunneling is part of that. There is also other type of infrastructure. The IS3 systems is we want to make it like um, software supermarket where we provide a framework and an API interface so that everyone can participate, contribute to the interface. The, that the server you see there, which is on the website, um, there you see the tunneling projects, these small dots on the map, right, in China. So these tunnel data, it is proprietary. So they, they belong to the owner and they, they, we need to um, respect the data protections and data management policies. But the basic tools part, we are making it uh, the basic framework open. As I said, at the iStream, we have already the website, we have the open interface so that other developers um, can contribute to that. So if there is specific need from owners, from contractors, one can personalize it. Of course, that part is preparatory. And we hope um, this open source part can make our community more prosperity. If you look at into larger community for research, for science, um, in physics, in computer science, there are so many open source platform like GitHub or, or SourceForge. And I hope this culture and this can also be brought into our tunneling where um, we can have some methodology part and the, the software part to be shared by the community. Very good. Thanks. Thank
that maybe I can continue that. It's a it's a it's a slightly different world being in a a, a private company uh, than being in, in a university. <laughs> I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, yeah. However, we have uh, we have set up uh, the system so such that it is a is a an OS. You see, the name is OS. It's a it's a framework upon which you can build anything. Actually, uh, we've built a version of Salesforce on the top of our own platform. Because uh, we didn't like Salesforce, so uh, it is an environment we've uh, focused in the last five years on making very, very configurable for people to be able to uh, to to develop and and publish. Uh, but Shani, you have uh, missed Cyber Monday by a day. You could have got the family pack yesterday if you'd uh, if you just been a day earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Yes, I can. Mm. maybe if I can continue. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, in, for uh, the Acello, uh, this innovation uh, comes directly from the contractor, uh, which has to build the works. So had to be uh, built. It was not just uh, uh, something that uh, was uh, an academic uh, uh, study or uh, uh, development. And in particular, uh, was very challenging because we spent almost two years only with a trial and error approach. Uh, basically trying to improve the solution and to provide a, even a design solution which could have been used by consultant and designer in the future project like that. Because for example, doesn't exist any geotechnical formulation to calculate, to estimate the upward jagging force. But, and we developed the various tests and procedure as well as real size test and monitoring the execution of one kilometer of uh, installation of riser provided to us plenty of information that uh, uh, are started to be published and uh, can be shared and uh, allowed the designer to know that there is uh, some other method which uh, can produce some benefit. Uh, the application can be straightforward because uh, it's already done, it has been already successfully done. So there are uh, application that can use this method. And uh, not only in artful project as well for excavation and for construction of uh, shaft, vertical shaft in con congested urban areas where there are limitation in the accesses from above, using <coughs> uh, an, up an upward method is something that can be done. When we started, we started from scratches, from nothing. There was not any pipe jagging made underwater, under in uh, soil condition and uh, in vertical. And uh, now this is a proof that can be done and can be used and is useful for both client, consultant, and contractors. Who uh, developed the machinery, Nicola? The machinery was developed here in Italy with, uh, with our, under our uh, uh, co co uh, coordination with a, a, a company which is named Palmieri. Palmieri Group, which is a known company in the tunneling industry. Yeah. And uh, we were able with them to, uh, to develop an innovation because uh, at the, initially uh, it's quite difficult to, to know in advance what you need to build. Uh, we were really starting from a white paper, trying to, uh, to know, the, we knew the needs, what was the result we were expecting to achieve but not uh, anything else was unknown. And uh, uh, was really important to work uh, with uh, companies, small companies that are uh, capable to develop uh, innovation and capable even to, to challenge uh, their, themselves. And this was uh, one of the key uh, driver of this, uh, uh, of this um, experience in Via Trello. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, you want to? Yes. Hello, Sunny. Thank you for the question. Tricky question. Um, from my side, uh, well, I have to say that we all, all have the same common understanding that the innovation uh, must come from project requirement, requirements. So let's say uh, we have faced uh, that situation many times uh, by offering this uh, three-dimensional virtual ring. And since it is not uh, described in the requirement from the project, okay, so it's not just accepted for the customer. Uh, it's, it's just this, this lack of, of knowledge. And for instance, uh, the International Tanya Association already published these guidelines that, that it helped uh, to, pro to promote and move this kind of innovation. And 
just talking about our system. I mean, uh, we use methodology uh, for uh, aeronautical industry and automotive industry because we have also another department uh, focused on this. Uh, but this technology is available to everyone. I mean, it's, it's not something that, that is exclusive from us. Okay, uh, what is exclusive for us is how we calculate uh, data processing and doing this best matching. Uh, but it's something that we really need to take for other industries and bring it into our industry because at the end we're talking here about just to uh, remove one one tradition, one operational that is there's a from my point of view a question mark whether it does make sense nowadays anymore, uh, yes or not. And um, Julien, yes. So this is a very interesting question, especially. For us, as we have, the, there was no, um, no, uh, no need that was actually expressed by the companies to have this monitoring. So we know that university researchers are making this kind of measurements and study to improve the DCS, but the contractors, they, they do the intervention based on the decompression tables. They follow it. If there is any uh, incident, they report it but we have created a new tool. And uh, actually it is quite difficult for, for us to, to reach other potential uh, contractors, customers. So this is why we are very happy to participate in this ITA tunneling award. We hope we have more visibility and <laughs> I address to, to all of you if uh, in your, your, future, uh, your future projects, you have any hyperbaric uh, interventions, we are here to help you monitor the safety of of your decompression procedures. Also, so we as a system, actually, we come from the diving uh, industry, but uh, uh, the tunneling also has a hyperbaric intervention. And we are already so recommended by Total, Total Energy now. So for the contractors, it is uh, considered a, a plus if they are working with us. But well, it is quite uh, challenging for us to reach a new potential user. And also one thing that's interesting to notice is that uh, with uh, so every new project brings data and allows to have more efficient uh, feedback for the, new, for the new project. I mean, with every project, we increase our database and we're able to be more precise and even better improve the safety of the work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Very good answer. Uh, I've got the last question to Julien. Uh, you said it allows that, that we have all this data without, without any doctor on site and so on. In terms of responsibility, uh, how does it work? Because uh, we know that it is a, a, um, something that might be dangerous and so on. So. Uh, bef before, in fact, the, the, the medical doctor was, was the one responsible of, and uh, it was his own responsibility. Here, how does it work? Yes. So actually, uh, for dive is not a medical device. So we are not here to say if the intervener should go back to the hyperbaric chamber or not. We work about, uh, with a statistical approach. So as you know, there are huge a huge number of factors involved in the occurrence of DCS. And it is not just having the word that we say this case will occur or not. So we work with the anonymous data. The companies, so when they, for every worker, they just put a, a code and we, we don't have the name of the people. So we are here to work on a mid, mid to long term approach. This is not, this is not meant to, to be used as a, and also a doctor, even on site, there they are no actions that need to be taken. Uh, on very short term, and of course we are working together with the hyperbaric uh, hyperbaric referring doctor. But there is no no need, let's say, to be in a in a short term uh, reaction. We work on a mid, mid to long term. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, any other last question before we close this very interesting panel discussion? Okay, so I want to thank you, thank all of you. Uh, on Thursday, 
uh, afternoon, 2 p.m. CET. There will be the award ceremony, so you will know who will get the this year award for the technical innovation. So you are all invited to participate in the ceremony, and of course, uh, we'll we as the award ceremony will be live like like live like this one, <laughs> not 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 fully live, but uh, not a pre-registered one. So. Uh, so the winner, the winner will have the opportunity to say some words uh, after he got the, the the award. So I invite all of you to to participate. So you will you will receive an an email with uh, with a link in order that you can participate and be there for the for the ceremony. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the all, all the presenters and all the all uh, Shani, Bob, Jaya, Andres for. Uh, coordinating and asking these interesting questions to all of you. Uh, we will have two other uh, uh, live panel discussion tomorrow. Uh, one with a finalist of uh, two categories, Beyond Engineering and, uh, and uh, um, Making Underground Works projects even better uh, in the morning from 11 to 12 uh, CET and in the afternoon at the same time as today for the category project of a year between 50 and 500 million euros. And this panel discussion will be available later today or probably uh, early tomorrow morning in the platform, in the room of uh, recorded sessions. So for the, not for you, but you will be there. And of course we will make this, uh, this recording of this session available to all of you. So you will be able to, to, to use it and, uh, and share with your, with your colleagues and clients and so on. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, have a nice evening and uh, see you soon for the rest of the IT Awards 2021. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. All thank very you very much. <laughs> very thank good inventions and innovations. Thank you so much. Very thank different. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.